Welcome to all for this lipstick lunch, which actually feels more like a coffee break in the Baltic. For those joining us for the first time, let me introduce Novatore. My co-founder Dagnia Leinja and I, by Barubessa, have launched an organization dedicated to women's economic empowerment and leadership by connecting, supporting, and driving the like-minded. For more details, please join our website at www.novatore.eu. One of our initiatives is based on advocacy to enlighten ourselves and decision makers on issues that hinder or drive women's economic empowerment. Little does she know herself, but today's speaker is actually Novatore's godmother. Her thinking, her book, The Double X Economy, and her engagement regarding women and the economy inspired us to create Novatore and Lipstick Lunches. Therefore, I'm particularly delighted that Professor Linda Scott has agreed to join us today. But first, the technicalities. The session will be no longer than half an hour. Linda will speak for about 10 to 15 minutes, and then you have the opportunity to comment, question, and discuss. These comments can be posted either in the Q&A function on Zoom in the bottom right corner of the screen, or on our Facebook page connected to this session. Later today, a recording of this Lipstick Lunch will be posted on our Facebook page, Novatore EU, for you to listen to again or share, as well as on YouTube. Now, without further ado, let me introduce today's speaker, Professor Linda Scott. Linda Scott is Emeritus DP World Professor of Entrepreneurship and Innovation at the University of Oxford and the author of The Double X Economy, The Epic Potential of Women's Empowerment. Her book was shortlisted for the Royal Society's Best Science Book of 2020 and was long listed for the Financial Times McKinsey and Company Best Business Book of 2020. The Double X Economy was also one of the Guardian's best science books of 2020 and is being translated into 10 languages Actually, we just found out 11, namely in Russian as of today, for release in 40 countries by the end of 2021. For 15 years, Professor Scott has worked with multinational corporations, international agencies, national governments, and global NGOs to design, implement, and test programs to better include women in the world economy. I'm very proud to give the floor to Linda Scott. unmute myself. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm really delighted to be here. And I'm very grateful um, to Baiba and to the Novatora project um, to uh, for inviting me to speak to you today. Um, since it's only 10 to 15 minutes, I'm going to get right into um, the, the uh, topic. Um, as, uh, as Baiba mentioned, I have published a book called The Double X Economy. And what I want to do in this talk is, first of all, to um, introduce you to what the double X economy is. Then I want to unpack it a little bit so you understand the, um, the, Im the impact of the double X economy in one particular area of the economy, and that's um, entrepreneurship. Then I want to talk to you about some of the things that can be done, because this is very much a, a book and a, uh, a stance that is focused on, on uh, actual reform and actually improving the position of women. Uh, the book itself is, is in, uh, intended to be as much a recruitment brochure as it is a, a, an explanation and a outline of the evidence on behalf of the double X economy. Uh, the women's economic uh, empowerment is a movement um, and uh, Novatora is an example of, of how it's um, beginning to flower around the world. Uh, it is a movement that has began about 15 years ago and counts among its um, members some of the um, or as players, some of the most um, influential and important institutions in the world, from the World Bank to major multinational corporations and global charities. Um, the devil X economy is a term that I coined to describe the, the economy of women. It is parallel in a way to what you might call the gig economy or the informal economy or even the underground economy. And that is that it is <clears throat> particular, it has particular distinctive marks in how that it uh, conducts business, and it is a 360 degree um, e 
economy, an actual economy. So it includes not only employment and advancement, but also access to capital, access to financial services, and access to markets. The women's economy in particular is um, defined by certain constraints. Um, these constraints are the same around the world. Uh, they're very long-standing constraints, constraints, some of them literally thousands of years old. Uh, and they produce um, a similar pattern of inequality, economic inequality um, for women around the world. And that pattern is fundamentally the same in every country. Um, the effects, um, it has been discovered, of the double X economy, which fundamentally excludes women from uh, full participation, the effects are quite enormous. Um, one of the ones that is top of mind for people who work in this um, area is its effect on growth. Um, there's considerable proof at this point that um, better including women in um, the economy uh, is a primary driver of GDP growth. It is not incidental. It is in many ways the most reliable and in some cases the largest driver of growth. It is so significant that policy at this point in economic development focuses often on trying to uh, empower women because um, it li lifts all ships, if you will. It is something that makes a big difference in the growth of a nation. Um, if, however, uh, the um, women are drawn back by uh, a decline, you know, a rollback of rights or a rise of a, a right-wing authoritarian government, for instance, uh, the threat is, in fact, that the company's, uh, country's economy will fall back uh, in terms of its growth. An example right now that some of you uh, are probably familiar with is that what's happening in Poland right now. Um, that uh, right-wing um, conservative groups um, position themselves as something that is going to better the circumstances in a country normally by asserting a return to traditional values. Very important to understand because it's an important uh, persuasive argument for women that if that happens, that women will then be forced to withdraw from the economy in a number of ways. And this will cause uh, a, a falling backward in terms of growth and is likely, in fact, to cause widespread poverty. Um, and so it's, it's very, very important to the entire population of a country that the women be allowed to be free and to prosper along with everyone else. It's also been discovered and, and proven substantially that there are human, humanitarian costs uh, to excluding women. And it's not my topic today to talk about the effect on poverty, but it is a substantial cause of poverty, uh, gender inequality is, and causes um, things that you might not uh, initially think would be attributable to women's exclusion, such as human trafficking and even civil conflict. So that uh, as part of the um, effort to recruit people to this cause, um, we would also then strongly uh, emphasize that something like this requires solidarity among women around the world because these are global issues, but also that uh, alliances can be and should be made with men. So I wanna to talk to you now about an example, uh, which is entrepreneurship of how the, um, the double X economy pans out uh, in terms of, um, of uh, impact on women in particular. I chose entrepreneurship because first of all, I understood that there were people in this audience that were interested in that, but also because it shows better the full, as I said, 360 degree um, impact uh, and constraint. So one of the things that is easily documented around the world is the long-term systemic uh, exclusion from women uh, from holding real property. Uh, some of the, uh, the Eastern European countries, uh, including Latvia, at the moment um, have taken steps that have equalized the ownership of, of real property, and this may or may not last. In history, it has not lasted, these kinds of, of reforms. Uh, but it has been very common to have laws and customs that ensure that land can only pass from one male to another and that women cannot hold it. Uh, as a result, around the world today, 80% of the, of the world's land uh, is owned and controlled by men, and less than 20% on average is owned and controlled by women. This is important because land ownership has been the, historically the primary store and source of wealth and power, and that the fact that women have not had access to it uh, has resulted in um, uh, as much of a monopoly on uh, the world's capital as the men have on the world's land. Um, and so what this means is that women are fundamentally um, still fundamentally 
disadvantaged to a very substantial degree in entrepreneurship because they are excluded from the capital markets to a very large degree. Um, women also have been denied control over assets, and these may be common household assets, or it may be um, the family portfolios, for example, will not have access to, to them for business purposes. And because of the, the exclusion from wealth and the exclusion from uh, other forms of assets, they have also traditionally been excluded from the fan financial sector in, ter in terms of access to financial services, and, uh, access to credit, and even access to employment. The financial sector tends to be one of the most male dominant and female exclusionary sectors in the global economy. Traditionally, women have also been excluded from market guilds and trade associations. Um, this still is the case around the world in many markets. And so women tend to be clustered in markets, some of which are low growth uh, and are systematically starved for capital. And we find that they are often uh, harassed um, in order to keep them uh, out of the market. Um, of course, the time poverty of family um, needs uh, is something that affects entrepreneurship as well as uh, employment. Uh, but it is also true, for example, that uh, women are more subject to corruption, government corruption around the world, which means that it's harder for women to register businesses or to engage in export. Mm -hmm. Some of the things that uh, we might do in terms of practical uh, interventions would be, for example, some form of ring fencing of, um, of capital availability such that investors have to invest uh, by law some percentage of their offerings in, uh, to women. Um, in some countries, this is an, an, a, a very uh, horrifying uh, suggestion, but it seems to be the necessary step along, just as it is um, quotas for ownership, I mean, excuse me, membership on boards. There have been also um, risk sharing uh, funds that have been set up, uh, particularly in impoverished countries where um, a major agency like the International Finance Corporation will have a large fund that can only be used uh, to fund women and is set up uh, to share perceived risk, even though women have been demonstrated actually to be a better credit investment than, than men. Um, there is need to reform the fin financial sector in a very, very broad way um, in terms of the customer side, but also the employment side. The employment side has an impact on the customer side because it um, has an effect on the degree to which uh, the sexual harassment uh, and various other ways in which women are kept out of the credit market and the investment market um, can occur. Um, there are a lot of programs in the world that um, increase network access to markets, um, such as the special uh, vendor exhibitions that have been held by the International Trade Center. Uh, and there have also there has also been recently a declaration on behalf of women by the World Trade Organization that is designed ultimately to facilitate the entry of women into world trade. As it currently stands, international trade is 99% controlled by men, so it is effectively a world monopoly. Um, there are also various targeted government interventions that can be indicated, such as um, some kind of odd ombudsmanship. Uh, programs uh, in custom uh, customs and uh, in export processing zones. And of course, there is um, always in every single area of the economy and every single country in the world, uh, the availability of childcare or the lack of it is the number one barrier uh, to women's economic empowerment. And what I am often uh, suggesting these days, especially in, in the aftermath of the, well, not the aftermath, but the lessons learned thus far from the pandemic is that we need to start thinking of childcare as an economic infrastructural investment, just like airports or road systems. And because of the need to include women in order for economies to continue to run in a positive direction. So what we're engaging today um, uh, and, and marking with, um, with the, um, the opening of, of this initiative um, is the need to uh, form a solidarity among women and, and to understand uh, what some of the uh, practical interventions are to know that this is not just an, uh, a, a situation of complaining uh, and that there are more interventions that can be undertaken legitimately and that there is research to document the importance of expanding the economy to better include women and the importance of taking targeted practical steps uh, and uh, initiating uh, directed programs to do so. So I hope that everyone listening will um, uh, 
engage uh, in this worldwide movement. Uh, it's very productive and it is open to anyone. There is something for everybody to do. Uh, and so once again, thank you very much for inviting me and I open up to back up to Baiba and to questions from uh, the audience. Thank you very much, uh, Linda. Uh, indeed, the, you know, your last um, couple of statements resonate a lot with us because we are looking really at building a strong sisterhood, first of all, in the Baltic, especially among those of us that are already very engaged uh, in the economic sector and, and can identify these issues and work on them, um, at least in the region, if not being able to uh, influence other societies as we go forward. Now for questions and answers, let me remind everybody that has connected, you can either uh, pose a question on Q&A in the uh, Zoom uh, connection, bottom right hand corner, or on Facebook, uh, on our site in Facebook where you're already watching. Uh, we've already had a couple of questions about where to buy your book. Uh, it is unfortunately not uh, in any of our bookshops, at least we, I haven't found any bookshop in Estonia, Latvia or Lithuania that carries it. However, by personal experience, it is for sure available via Amazon. So uh, just click on the double X economy. Jeff, maybe we'll make another uh, dollar or a euro or two on this, but uh, it is well worth the investment. Uh, while I wait for other questions, uh, a question, my question. You're also a founder of the Power Shift Forum for Women in the World Economy that brings together professionals and activists engaged in um, women's economic empowerment. Why do you think there should be a community, a community that is specifically around um, women's economic empowerment? Not women's right. rights and yeah, whatever I think, else I maybe. I think that um, one of the things that um, that you mentioned in, in uh, your remarks just now opening up to questions is very important um, in terms of women who are already engaged in business and economics um, being brought into uh, this um, uh, this movement. Um, there's a very big need for that because in most um, women's organizations to date, they normally tend to focus on violence or focus on reproductive rights our legal rights and not so much economic rights. Um, and it is a very specialized area and there aren't enough w expert women who are engaged with it. Well, we need women who have some sophistication with regard to business um, experience with regard to business, particularly, for example, the financial sector. Um, and so I think it's very important to have fora uh, in which women can, who have these kinds of interests and these kinds of uh, expertise uh, to be engaged. Um, I think um, Power Shift was originally um, uh, envisioned as something that was about us uh, more specialists in policy. It was, um, it, uh, it engaged a lot of corporations. A lot of corporations were engaged, but it was in their activities with governments and other types of international organizations. And um, the idea was to share some of the learning that I, that I reference when um, these organizations would go into countries and work on very developing specific programs and testing them. Um, I want for that kind of a thing to continue, but there is a need at this point to open it up beyond specialist groups. And so that's what we'll be looking to. We were planning to do a power shift this year, but we got shut down uh, by the pandemic. So, um, so it might be a while before we have another one, or we may try to do one um, virtually. I think, however, that I'm, I'm really happy to see more regional and local groups, because there are regional and local issues though the main mechanisms will be the same, some circumstances are substantially different. And I, I think that um, uh, things are much better uh, in the Baltics than they are in some areas, much better. Um, but the general area of Eastern Europe is quite concerning. Um, and, uh, and so I'm, I'm very pleased to see uh, any kind of activity in that general region. I, some of the um, uh, individuals connected right now to this session are actually, uh, I'd say, leaders in the financial sector in the Baltic. And in the Baltic, from a gender point of view, we certainly have an awful lot of women genuinely as trailblazers in, in very different ways in the financial sector. Having said that, there is still a discrepancy of about 23% in remuneration in the financial sector. So, you know, there are contradictions wherever we go. 
Now, Aya Ingrid asks question, uh, uh, a question about issues of corruption and women in business. Is that a tendency more prevalent in third world countries than Nordic countries or a general tendency? Um, so there is a UN report on, the, on, on the, the unequal impact of corruption, and it is a global study. However, most of your evidence is going to be in, in so-called third world or poor countries because simply because there is there has been historically more uh, focus on women's economic empowerment by policy groups in as an economic development strategy. Um, however, I think the evidence um, does suggest that the reasons for it have to do with the uh, sort of the safety um, um, in some areas of the government of being able to sort of um, passively frustrate or cheat women in this area. And that is likely to be true anywhere where there aren't um, effective government constraints. Um, I did do a study myself uh, or in conjunction with the World Bank uh, in Moldova uh, about two years ago, which is it's a very different economic situation from what you see in the Baltics. Um, uh, but it is closer than, you know, looking at something like, you know, uh, East Africa, right? Um, and what we found there was in every single sector of the economy, except manufacturing, uh, there was there was corruption against the women across all government functions, but no corruption against the men. Uh, it was really extraordinarily lopsided. Wow. Um, Vanda Dauksa asks, what do you re recommend regarding education schools policies and programs to empower girls and young women i think that um that it does depend a great deal uh on the circumstances in the in the local economy and um in the more developed nations uh, you see uh, a more uh the women being more present in uh, higher education uh, at every level um, and actually in most areas, except for digital technology and engineering. And it is important to talk a bit more about that, I think. Um, however, I do think that um, business and financial training would be uh, a good investment to be made beginning at even at the primary school level. It's not that it's not that females have some kind of cognitive disadvantage in understanding finance. It's more that the cultures world culture does not intend to uh, does not uh, tend to um, train them and give them access and put them in circumstances in which they learn to manage money. And so if we did a better job of that, I think we would, uh, we would encourage more women to go into finance, I think, uh, is, is one of the issues, um, and maybe change perceptions. Um, I do want to speak to there's generally a feeling that women are I see it around the world that women are are exceeding men in terms of higher education, and that is definitely true everywhere except Africa. Um, but that oh, it's not the right uh, things that they study, and it's important to understand that women are present in the sciences and in mathematics, in equal and in business training, in equal or greater numbers around the world than men. And the reason that we see these these very big gaps. Um, uh, according to so-called STEM subjects, is that the um, the sciences where females dominate are excluded from that definition all of a sudden. So sciences like the health science, medical sciences, um, biology, epidemiology, all of these are no longer considered STEM for that rhetorical purpose. And if you did, you would have more than equal women because in those sciences, women dominate to a very large degree. Wow. Um... The um, New York Times book review of the double X economy says that you relay anger. Are you angry? Is it even possible to discuss the historic gender inequalities without an ounce of rage? Yeah, um, I think that to be perfectly honest, um, I have had one or two reviews that have commented on the anger and I was kind of surprised to be honest because my intention uh, with the book was to make it hopeful uh, overall, uh, to be able to point to very specific things that we know uh, that we can do and very specific things that we know will benefit the entire population if we do them. And so um, I intended for it to be hopeful. However, 
uh, it is a situation that is so extreme and so sad and so long standing that yes, I think anyone with any ounce of respect for social justice or compassion for humanity would be angered by it. Uh, and in particular, there are some, uh, there is a chapter on uh, the trafficking in women uh, disguised, if you will, in, as marriage in world history that is so brutal uh, that it was hard for me to write it. I had writer's block for months about that chapter. It was so depressing. So, yeah. And, and, and you know, when you have a legitimate, um, a, a legitimate social injustice, nobody should be surprised if women are being angered by it. I, I like to call it, I like to call it righteous indignation instead. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a very good way of uh, describing it. I know that I've felt that uh, righteous indignation. Uh, actually, the older I get and the more you face certain kind of uh, issues, even from a distance. Yeah, you get really, yes, I agree. As, as I've gotten older, the more impatient I am and the more likely I'm to call it out in very plain terms. So, and that's another thing at the book is it's very, I don't mince words in this book. It's very straightforward. So, yeah. It reads like a novel, at least for me. I have a completely different question and it's a question on titles. Now, recently, uh, there was a hot debate when the First Lady of the United States advised that she should be addressed using her academic title, Dr. Jill Biden. You also have an impressive title, Professor Linda Scott. Do you believe that this contributes to women's empowerment? I think, I, I think that, yes, I think, um... For me, for example, I use professor instead of doctor. It's more common to use doctor in the US. Mm -hmm. uh, I use professor because it is a, a very specific title in the United Kingdom uh, and because it is hard to get that title. Um, and so it was, a, it was a point of pride to me just as, as it is for Dr. Biden. Uh, and so I use it. Um, for me, it is also because um, there aren't very many women from Oxford uh, who have won that title. Um, and so I feel like it's a reminder to people that it is possible to do this and that it's, it's good to do it. Um, and the same kind of thing happens with, the, uh, with regard to the First Lady. The First Lady's position in the United States historically has been more one of hostess, right? And it's only been in recent uh, presidencies that it's become more substantial. So I think it's part of that general direction of travel and it's good for her to, to mark it in a new way. Linda, we're slowly coming to the end. Uh, would you be kind enough perhaps to share some practical advice for women who wish to be in charge of their professional de development or, you know, how to better their chances at professional success? What would you tell these young women? Right. Um, I am not particularly one to give advice for individuals. I think that uh, individual advice and how to climb the corporate ladder or any ladder um, is widely available and you can you know you can choose um, from an individual point of view any number of, of advice books um, i think that there's a fundamental flaw in 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 that kind of literature and that it tends uh like lean in for example is the most famous by Sheryl sandberg right mm -hmm. is that um it does not recognize that this is a structural systemic problem that this is not an individual problem um, and it often is treated as an individual problem within companies and other organizations as a way of not dealing with it as a widespread problem and not acknowledging that it is probably a problem throughout the organization. So it is, it is difficult, but it is important to begin talking to other women about it. So the, the number one advice that I would say is try to form a solidarity among the other women, even so far as that you share things like salary information. Um, uh, women are usually cut out of um, men's groups that do share salary information so they don't know. So I would say my, my, main, my main advice would be lock arms with the other women. That's fabulous advice. And that's a good last statement. For Professor Linda Scott, the Double X Economy, I would like to thank everybody who have joined us to, today and who have decided to look at this recording a little bit later. Our next lipstick lunch will be after Easter on April the 6th. Please continue to follow us on LinkedIn, 
Facebook and our um, website to find out who will be our next speaker. So thank you very much for everybody for joining. Goodbye until the next time.